The United Nations Humanitarian Coordination Office has confirmed that at least 10,000 bodies remain under the rubble in Gaza as the fear for a worsening health situation given the arrival of high temperature increases. Panama Supreme Court accepted the candidacy of José Raúl Molino for its organization Realizando Metas, or Achieving Goals, days before general elections in the country. And in Haiti, several political, social and religious organizations denounced that the election of Fritz Belisair as interim prime minister was undemocratic. Hello and welcome to From the South. My name is Belen de los Santos and from the Telesur studios in Havana, Cuba, we begin with the news. The United Nations Humanitarian Coordination Office has confirmed that at least 10,000 bodies remain under the rubble in Gaza. The arrival of high temperatures raises fears of a serious health situation. Several UN agencies and the Palestinian government have made reference to the terrifying situation in the enclave. They claim that the entire neighborhoods were destroyed in one of the most densely populated areas on the planet. In addition to the number of bodies under the rubble, they warned that there could be more than 7,500 tons of unexploded explosives taking into account that during a brief tour, the UN anti-mine team found 500 kilograms in the middle of the road. In this context, the agencies urged the entry of heavy machinery to begin the removal of debris. And also in Palestine, the death toll rose after new massacres occurred in the last 24 hours, in which Israel killed 28 people and wounded 51 others. The health authorities affirmed that the total number of casualties is increasing daily due to ongoing Israeli siege that intensified as of October 7, 2023. Gas and Health Ministry affirmed that the number of martyrs so far exceeds 34,596, while well, the number of wounded has risen to 77,816, most of them women and children. Health authorities emphasize that those numbers do not include the over 10,000 Palestinians that remain under the rubble. And the World Health Organization reported at least 443 attacks on the Gaza health system since October 7th. The international health body highlighted that the attacks have caused nearly 723 deaths, 924 wounded and the destruction of at least 101 health facilities. It also reiterated its claim that the health institutions shouldn't be targets of attacks since they affect innocent civilians, the health personnel and volunteers of international humanitarian aid organizations. Israel continues to justify the attacks against civilian targets with the argument that members of Hamas could use them as cover. And also in Palestine, Israeli occupation forces spray toxic and poisonous liquid inside the Han Yunus homes, causing intoxication among its inhabitants. The civil defense teams detailed that the actions were discovered after a family went to a local health center with poisoning symptoms and green poison was found in the walls of its house. Health authorities denounced the incidents as genocidal actions by Israel against the Gazan population. And in this context, Palestinian authorities announced the reopening of the al Amal hospital after its closure on March the 27th due to the Israeli bombardment and siege. The health facility, which belongs to the International Red Crescent Organization and is located in the city of Han Yunis, has 100 beds and focused on maternal and child health, 
basic surgical and internal medicine needs and specialized rehabilitation services. According to the World Health Organization, only 12 of the 36 hospitals in Gaza are currently partially functioning, six of them in the south and six in the north, while 23 are not functioning at all. The government of Iran sanctioned eight individuals and five British entities for the support of Israel's genocide in Palestine. The sanctions were announced by the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of Iran in compliance with the law to fight hostile activities of the Zionist regime against peace and security. The enforcement affects an air base of the British Royal Air Force in Cyprus, the diamond ship of the British Naval Force in the Red Sea, the British company Perker Megid, among other entities. While the list of sanctioned individuals includes UK Defence Secretary Grant Shapps, the Director of British Defence Intelligence Adrian Bird, and the Commander of the ship Diamond in the Red Sea, Peter Evans. Meanwhile, in the United States, police authorities dismantled the protester camps at universities of California in Los Angeles where more than 100 students have been arrested in pro-Palestinian demonstrations. The university was taken over by at least 250 police officers who attacked the demonstrators and forced them to leave the premises. In this context, thousands of students and professors from several universities in the North American country have been demanding for two weeks that the university stop investing in companies and individuals who profit from the war in the Gaza Strip. Now let's take a short break, but remember you can join us on TikTok at Telesur English where you will find news in different formats, news updates and much more. Other stories coming up, stay with us. Welcome back to From the South. On Friday, the Supreme Court of the Panamanian Court declared that the candidacy of Jose Raul Mulino, presidential candidate of the organization Realizando Metas, or Achieving Goals, is not unconstitutional. In this sense, the president of the Supreme Court of Justice, Maria Eugenia Lopez Arias, communicated the decision after almost four days of deliberation. Jose Raul Molino is one of the front runners according to the polls for Sunday's general elections and his nomination is to replace former President Ricardo Martinelli, who was disqualified after being sentenced to more than 10 years in prison. Molino, 65 years old, was the minister in charge of foreign affairs back in 2012. And in this context, in Panama, the electoral campaign for next Sunday's presidential election has come to a close. According to the country's electoral board, eight presidential candidates have been registered for the elections. On the other hand, polls show that 20% of the more than 3 million Panamanians with the right to vote are still undecided for whom to vote. Besides president and vice president, voters will also elect the deputies to the Central American Parliament and to the National Assembly and mayors, townships, representatives and councilmen across the country. In other news, the president of Venezuela, Nicolás Maduro, denounced the interfering intentions of Washington to impose a new colonialist model by applying prop titles over the natural domestic resources. On a march for the Workers' Day, Maduro ensured that despite U.S. sanctions, the state will recover workers' incomes. Likewise, the president indicated that the biggest mobilization of the working class ever seen in Venezuela was that of Wednesday, in which the different states in the nation gathered in the Caracas city to celebrate which, with a march their labor demands alongside the head of state and other political authorities. que los gringos pretenden imponer un modelo colonialista, 
You know the U.S. empire is trying to impose a colonialist model, don't you? What country on earth can accept that? Will Venezuela accept to request a license from another country to produce its own oil in its own land? To take our oil out and then move it by ship and sell it? Can Venezuela accept the U.S. imposition of that model? A model that makes us go to the United States to ask for a license to produce our oil? We will never accept it. Never. In this context, the Venezuelan president also said that so far 100% of the internal food market is now produced nationally. We have guaranteed 100% supply of the country's domestic market with national production. 100% of Venezuela's food is produced here today. Thanks to whom? To the farmers. To the farmers to the farmers and the farmers of the country. And we stay in Venezuela as the Attorney General's office revealed new evidence linking a sector of the opposition to those involved in the PDVSA crypto corruption plot. The Attorney General Tarek William Saab recalled that in the first phase of the PDVSA crypto case, there was a total of 54 detainees and clarified that he was always offered information on the ongoing investigations. The prosecutor denounced that the former minister Elay Sami and his assistants formed a criminal organization, emphasizing that the audios collected with more than 40 hours of recordings where they mentioned the coordination with representatives of the U.S. diplomacy were shown. It expresses and reveals the corruption plot, not only a political conspiracy. Listen, a brutal billionaire corruption that involves particularly and especially, and I'll say it openly, Leopoldo Lopez and Julio Borges with a PDVSA crypto corruption plot. I want to know where they will hide now after what was said by Samar López, who, as you remember, was Alay Sami's right-hand man, about how the corruption worked through the oil tankers, which they assigned as they wish, without leaving any record behind and using the names of some star contractors. In this context, the Venezuelan general attorney also stated that the evidence gathered showed a conversation in which the defendants plot against and plot to overthrow the government of Nicolás Maduro. They openly talked about the overthrow of President Nicolás Maduro and about an amateurish coup, but a coup anyway, with grenades and rifles on April 30, 2019. They talked as if regretting not having achieved their objectives. That it didn't happen because of this, or that it didn't happen because of that, and that it didn't happen because one ratted out, and so on. Regretting that only seven people showed up at the Altamira Bridge when one million were expected, etc. And about the Gideon operation, which was a terrorist operation, to be carried out through a mercenary company, Silvercon where there was a millionaire contract of over $200 million that way those signed together with other people. We go now to Haiti, where several social, civil and religious organizations denounced that the election of Fritz Belisar as interim prime minister was undemocratic. According to the Conference of Haitian Pastors, the April 3rd agreement contemplated the participation of other civil society entities, but this principle was not respected. On the contrary, the appointment of Belisar took place in the shadows with the presence of State Department personnel. Leslie Voltaire, representative of Fan Milavalas and a member of the Presidential Council, protested this decision. In the midst of this tension, criminal bands once again imposed violence in the capital, Port-au-Prince. And in Haiti, gang attacks continued against the population in several neighborhoods of the capital at a time of according to of, in which, according to official statements, persistent gunfire by armed groups terrorized families living in downtown Port-au-Prince and outlying areas. Likewise, there were calls from people in difficulty in these areas as the detonations became more and more intense in the middle of the night. 
Moreover, citizens indicated that they are trying to flee the areas due to the escalation of the situation. And also in this context of violence, after the former senator Edgar Leblanc fails, was appointed as the new president of the Presidential Transitional Council in Haiti on April 30th, he promised progress in the security situation in the country. However, following this appointment, the controversy caused by the announcement of the election of a prime minister outside the stages set out in the April 3rd crisis exit agreement raises fears of a new upsurge in the crisis. And we have a final short break coming up, but before we invite you to join our WhatsApp community for our English speaking audience, you can scan the QR code on screen to join directly and also share the link to reach more people. Constant news coverage of Latin America and the Caribbean, as well as the rest of the world. Stay connected and informed with Telesur. Final short break, don't go away. Welcome back to From the South. In Brazil, in the state Rio Grande do Sul, heavy storms have, co have caused at least 28 people dead and dozens missing. Let's see more details in the following report. Lives lost, roads destroyed, entire cities underwater, landslides, boats out of control. The apocalyptic scenes correspond to a new extreme weather event in Rio Grande do Sul a storm considered the biggest environmental disaster in its history, but an increasingly recurrent situation not only in this state. The Ministry of the Environment is therefore seeking to act on both an environmental disaster management front and a prevention front. We are seeking to decree a permanent climate emergency in the 1,038 sufficient municipalities and our country's weather research center is expanding that base to 2,942 municipalities which may recurrently have these weather events. Opposition parliamentarians in Rio Grande do Sul denounced that the local government only used 0.2% of the budget to prevent environmental disasters, despite the increasingly frequent extreme weather events. President Lula went to the region and promised unlimited aid in the face of the crisis. A field hospital was set up and the armed forces sent more than 600 soldiers to the region. We will not allow a lack of resources to halt the reparation of the damages, as we did not allow it in the Vale du Taquari or during the drought here in Rio Grande do Sul. In 2023, Rio Grande do Sul accounted for 40% of the emergency decrees related to rainfall. In one year, the state suffered 10 extreme weather events ranging from storms to droughts that affected food production. The emission of greenhouse gases is once again in the spotlight during the fight against climate change. We have to ask ourselves what are we doing to prevent this change, when, for example, a few days ago the G7 decided only to soften the burning of coal, which today represents 65% of all planetary energy and is a major polluter. We are questioning these commitments because the energy transition must happen and the reduction of flaring and deforestation is also a necessity. The collision of a cold front arriving from Argentina and Uruguay with a dry and warm air mass in southeastern and central western Brazil, abnormal for autumn, will mean more rains will continue during the week. 
The scenario will worsen with the rupture of the July 14 power plant dam and its domino effect on the rivers that will affect the capital city of Porto Alegre. Meanwhile, in neighboring Argentina, storms were also developing over the provinces of Misiones, where close to 500 people were evacuated in the last hours. Authorities reported that several streams and drains were collapsed, causing the flooding of at least 100 houses in the city. Intense rainfall was also recorded in the province of Posadas, in the province of Misiones, which caused innumerable complications in housing, road and environmental matters, with the overflowing of streams, evacuation of people, flooding of roads and disorders in different watercourses. In Vietnam, over 260 hectares of forest consumed as the result of climate change induced wildfires. Local authorities reported that in the last few days, around 15 active fires have been detected in several provinces of the country, the latest fire in the northern province of Ha Giang, where the blaze consumed about 20 hectares of forest and killed two foresters. In this regard, the national government demands that local authorities implement efficient measures to prevent and combat fires, as well as to promote public awareness campaigns on the issue. And in Colombia, the Colombian Air Force joined other work teams to support the extinction of the forest fire in the Isla de Salamanca Park in the northern part of the country. The institution provided support by making aircraft available. The deployment carried out surveillance and recognition flights over the affected region. Also, as C-40 aircraft transported professionals and specialized teams from the National Fire Department of Colombia in Bogotá to Barranquilla. The firefighter mission required the use of the Bumby Bucket method, suspended by a helicopter and loading three gallons of retardant liquid and 6,615 gallons of water. And like this, we have come to the end of this news brief. But you can find these and many other stories on our website at telesorenglish.net. And also join us on social media. We are on Facebook, X, Instagram, Telegram, and also on TikTok. For Telesor English, my name is Belen de los Santos. Thank you for watching.